dealing with spiritual lows. So last week I did a, a sermon on, on David and Goliath. We all know, all know David and Goliath. So we know that David was this young shepherd guy and he came from his, um, well, he had a lot of brothers, but he came from the field and he had to do this war against Goliath. Goliath, three meter long, about three meters tall. He's the, point, the point of his sword was about seven, kil, seven, seven kilograms, and he used it. And um, David had a lot of voices. I had a lot of voices telling him he had a lot of voices telling me can't. He had a voice of the, the enemy, of Goliath. So Goliath stood there saying, you can't, you can't. He had the voice of his king, his mentor, his leader saying, you can't, you won't be able to do it. The voice of people around him saying he can't. And then the voice of, what am I missing now? Which voice am I missing now? Uh, of his family, of his family, the close relatives, voice of his family. So the, the, when I read it again, it, it intrigued me so much. So David defeated Goliath. He took out his sword, he cut off his head, and he took Goliath's head and he, and he marched back to, to Israel. So what happened then? What happened after that? We all know that story quite well. So David, the hero of our story, we know, defeated Goliath. He defeated him without a sword, without a spear, without nothing. He didn't even wore some armor. So if we go to the Old Testament, I just want to show you this. Um, at Egypt, at the end of Egypt, there it's called the Mediterranean Sea. When you turn around, it's where Iraq, Iran, and those areas are. So this part is on the right hand side where Iraq, Iran, and those areas are going around. This was mainly where Canaan was. This was where the Old Testament happened and where the New Testament happened. So Canaan was there. There's a, a, a little piece of water there in the middle there. Canaan was this whole whole section there was Canaan. It was the beloved land. So remember when you read your Bible and they say that we're going to the beloved land, remember they're coming from there, from Egypt. Why are they coming from Egypt? Because in Egypt they had food. Why did they have food? Because it was a rain, like rainy season, so they could plant crops, they could harvest, they could have food. And then they fled from Egypt to where? Now remember it's desert. So they're fleeing from Egypt going where? This was the nearest or the best place for them to settle because of rain and etc. etc. So, hulle so hier na toe gekom het om, om het hulle weer het so it would be a great place to live because of rain. Rain would give you food because you could plant, you could harvest, etc. etc. When we read the Old Testament, we know that when they came into Canaan, this land that God promised, God, God promises this promised land. When they came there, they weren't alone. They weren't alone. There were other people there as well. One of the other groups that was there were the Philistines. So the one that David killed, the one that David killed, the Philistine, they were also part of this land. So they're all fighting in this area. They're fighting for this piece of land. Why? Because this land is very prosperous. It, it has, it has, um, that can buy costs and good for the So what happens? David defeats one of the armies there. Israel is in there, and there's a lot of other people there. And they're all fighting for survival. They're fighting for survival. But the kingdom of Israel is the most important one. It's that blue one up there. So you'll see the blue one is, is Israel, and then Philistine is the red one on this side. So it was those two armies who met uh, between David and Goliath. So all this war is going on. It's in the promised land. Everything is happening here. Everything's supposed to go smooth. And they, they've come off this great war, which David has won. David, the unlikely character, came out of the war. He won. He comes in with, with Goliath's head. What happens? As he enters the city with Goliath's head, the people chant. He means this play. He goes back to Israel. And the people are happy. And who are they cheering for? For? David, 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 1 Samuel 17. David said to the, oh, just going back to it, um, that war, remember, he said, it, the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. So we read in 1 Samuel 18, we read, Saul's growing fear of David. Saul was the king, he was the king at that time. And he was supposed to defeat these enemy armies, but then he had the shepherd guy who did it for him. 
So when he comes back, when the men re were returning home after David had killed the Philistine for Goliath, the women from all the towns of Israel came to meet King Saul. And they were singing and dancing with joyful songs and with tem uh, timbrels of tam tamburaina and, and lira, lira and tamburaina. As they danced and they sung, Saul, ne, the king, the king, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. I can imagine, I'm the king of Israel coming back on my horse. I've got all my troops surrounding me. I've just won a battle. But coming into my city, all the women cheering and everyone cheering, they're cheering for me, but there's a little guy coming along, dragging along, not wearing a uniform, not wearing a war outfit, wearing his, his little, say, rock thing, what they saw on here, and they're cheering for him. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Is that fair? Okay, I'll, I'll just read the passage as it goes along. In 1 Samuel 18, goes on. So Saul creates this growing fear of David. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, as he wrote in. They, they, they're singing to this guy that he's beaten so much more than me, but only me with a thousand. So what is next? If I come into this place, my kingdom, and... I wasn't successful, but David was. What is the next move? If the people love him more than me, what is the next move? If they like David more than they like me, what is the next move? David will become king. I will lose my place of power. I will lose my place of power. So Saul needs to devise a plan. I'm no planner, Mark, because... His life is in, well, no, his kingdom is in danger. So what does he do? He offers his daughter in marriage. So he offers his first daughter in marriage, and, and David's response to that was, I'm too poor. I can stay arm. I say, I sit on a plank and say, how can I deserve this? How can I deserve to marry the daughter of the king? Well, Saul is still afraid of him. So David denies the first daughter. Then Saul comes and he offers his second daughter. He says, marry my second daughter, Michal. Marry her. But if you want to marry her, go and kill some more Philistines. Go and kill some more Philistines. So this is a very gruesome spot, but it's in the Bible. I'm going to have to tell it. Bring me the four skins of the Philistines. It's important. Because they are not part of who God, God's people is. So he says, bring me a hundred of them. And David comes back, obviously David, with 200. He killed more double than what he, what, he, what he did. So what was interesting in these times is that because there was so much war, it wasn't just Israel fighting the Philistines or, or Goliath and them. There were other people as well, and they all tried to survive. So David became a very, very good warrior. He became a soldier. He became a very good soldier. Now David is now married to the king of Saul, trying to, so that Saul can just save his kingdom. But Saul has a son. He has a son. Jonathan. So as I was reading the passage, it was so interesting for me that so Saul's son, Jonathan, also became friends with David. And what I read through the passages is David became such a likable guy. Everybody loved him. There's even this weird scenario where, where he and, and Jonathan hugs each other and they, they wept deeply. But then as Saul looks at David, he just becomes jealous. Now I was thinking, how must David have felt? Coming from a background of nothing, a shepherd, threatening a king. Using no weapons to threatening a king. And then achieving all these successes as he goes. He's coming from nothing. He, like Almighty Faltite kills Goliath. He kills Philistines. He, kills, he becomes 
He becomes so famous that the king's children love him. Jonathan, Jonathan becomes his best, best friend. Um, Michal, uh, the, the king's daughter, becomes his wife. And everybody in the streets, they love David. David, David, David. And Saul gets jealous and jealous. And so Saul tries to, to kill David, not once, but many times. And you know what happens? One time he tries to kill David, and his own daughter warns David and says, My pa, will you do it, Mark? Hard loop. Another time he tries to kill David, and Saul's son, Jonathan, says, My father wants to kill you. Can you imagine how Saul felt? I is jaloers, soos nog nooit nie. Jealousy, 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 jealousy. Wants to kill them. And how must David have felt? What did I do wrong? David said. What did I do wrong? I only came, I was a shepherd. And I only trusted the Lord. And the living God, the Lord helped me to defeat Goliath. He, did, he helped me to achieve fame, to, to become likable, to become an important figure in Israel. And now the king wants to kill me. In fact, it got, it got so bad that, that he had to flee. Many times he had to flee away. I must wait for soul. And then there are two instances, 1 Samuel 19 and then 1 Samuel 20, where he gets the chance of revenge. Now, I wonder if this happened to you and me, if we were to say that I come from a ba bad background and I start achieving success, what happens to me? People don't like me. No, I'm not saying me, but you get the picture. So coming from that, so there will be voices like, that, like I said with David. These voices grew stronger, and the one of the king grew so strong that he wanted to kill him. David should have been happy, likable, lovable, famous, yet the king never accepted him. The king tried to kill him. And then, interesting, two times, David gets a chance at revenge. David gets a chance at revenge. So the one time, I'm telling you these stories because it's all down, but you can read it. It's 1 Samuel 17 to 22. So the one time he gets revenge is in a cave. It's a very gruesome story, but um, Saul went to go number two. <laughs> and when Saul came to the back of the cave, so Saul had 3,000 people with him, 3,000 soldiers. He went into the cave to go relieve himself, and David was behind him. So David had an opportunity of assassination like never before. It was such an easy target. Saul had no one else beside him. It would have been one of the easiest kills ever. Because, I mean, if he could have killed Goliath across a battlefield, killing Saul who knelt before him, but for him could have been so easy. And you know what David did? He took a piece of Saul's clothing and he cut a piece of his clothing off. And when Saul went out, he came out and he said, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Because you are anointed by the Lord. You're anointed by the Lord. A second time came when they were sleeping. So David he formed like this, this um, just guerrilla warfare. You know what guerrilla warfare is? When you take a, a small bunch of people, but they become very um, specialized. So this little war gang of, of, of David became very, very versatile and very potent, very deadly. And one time they were watching Saul, and Saul fell asleep. And while Saul was asleep, David and his, his, MS, his second in charge crept up, they let up right next to Saul. And he had a second chance to kill him. And, and the one next to him says, kill this guy because this guy wants to kill you. He wants to kill you. He's tried it many, 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 many times. Mark him do it. And David says, no. David takes the water bottle right next to Saul's head. He takes the water bottle away. And he says, no. He goes again to Saul. He says, I, can't you do it, I could have killed you a second time. But I'm not going to kill you because you're anointed by God. What 
would you have done? To the person who's doing everything in their might to kill you. And this time in, in this verse, it was physically. He tried to kill him physically all the time. And each time when David had the chance of revenge, he said, it's not what the Lord wants. It's not what the Lord wants. Thinking about David, he had all these skills. He had the Lord on his side. If David were to listen to the voices around him, it would have been an easy choice. As, as David, as, as, as I must say it, well, this is actually quite easy. I mean, he could have taken this, these two instances and says, because in the second one it says, the Lord has given Saul to you. And he says to him, no, that's not how the Lord works. And for some people, maybe it could have been, no, the Lord has given him to me. Let me just quickly sort him out. Let me just quickly kill him. Sometimes we believe that the Lord hands us as our enemies so that revenge can take place. Nay, we love it. We love it. We love it when, when people attack us and attack us and throw us and try to kill us. And then in Andrade view, and then when I get my chance, I want just to deliver my blow. David leaves it. David doesn't attack. David doesn't retaliate. And that's what really struck me about the, the story about David, is that he had all the power to do so. So what happens in the end? David becomes more famous, more lovable, more... There's also the story that, that the, the Bose Gies and Saul and Geganet, but it was not mainly that. It was the fact that Saul was jealous of David. How did Saul die then in the end? We know that in the end, Saul, and we are reading 1 Samuel 31. It's the end of the first book of Samuel. So what happened was he, he took his own life. Saul takes his own life. Saul said to his armor bearer, the, the one helping him fight, draw your sword and run me through or these uncircumcised fellows will come through me. So even the followers of David wanted to kill Saul, but David rebuked them. It says there a few times, it says, David stopped them. So Saul says, let me just die. But his armor bearer, the one next to Saul, didn't want to kill him. So Saul took his own sword and he fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that and they saw Saul was dead, he too fell on his own sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and three armor bearers all died together on the very same day. The war between the house of, and two Samuels, the second book of Samuel starts with this. He says, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David just grew stronger and stronger while Saul grew weaker and weaker. And then David became king. This whole story could have been different if David thought that this is the way the Lord thinks. The Lord has put a bad king in place who is jealous and who doesn't work ethically correct. The, the people like me. The people love me. The people chant for me. They say I must take revenge and I must become king. And then David says no. I'm waiting for the right time of the Lord to become king. So there's a few sermons you can get out of these texts. And, and one is that once you become famous, you will always get haters. And once you grow in stature and you become more popular, or etc., et you will always get people who don't like you. The question is not that. The question is what do you do with them? And if you get the chance to retaliate, to the enemies in your life. Do you really think it's the Lord? Do you really think it is the way the Lord works, that He hands you your enemies so that you can retaliate, so that you can take out a knife and you can kill them? David never did it. David never retaliated. But in the end, Saul did what he did. It happened like that. So what I wanted to call the sermon was how to deal with spiritual lows. 
and spiritual eyes, but spiritual lows. Because coming from where David was, coming from that high to going to that low where he had to flee for his life, I mean, what did he do wrong? What did David do wrong for him, for the king of Israel to kill him? It was just jealousy. There was nothing else. It was never jealous. So what did he do wrong? He could have sat under, sat under a tree and said, Lord, this is so unfair. This is so unfair. Why does he want to kill me when all I did was I defeated Goliath and I did what was kind of good for everyone? Everyone liked me. Why does the king want to kill me? But David remained faithful to the Lord, saying, the Lord's timing is not my timing. And that is a vital to this, to this text is David didn't become king because he wanted to. He just trusted the Lord for the process, saying, Here, help me, face me, vanier and who. And when it came to the fact that earthly things happened, when his enemy got delivered to him, he said, This is not the way the Lord works. I wondered how, if I would have done the same, if you would have done the same. If you had had the chance to say that something so unfair is happening to me, yet the Lord decided to give this guy to me, and I'm saying, no, I'm not going to retaliate. So in the end, David becomes king. David also makes his mistakes. We read later on, David makes his mistake. Met Batsiba, funny, she was bathing, but, but, Batsiba. <laughs> He loved women. It's, it's, those three kings really loved women. Well, the second two, because David loved women. He had Bathsheba, and then Solomon had a thousand women. That's 700, 300. That's a thousand women. I worked out that's about three years of just listening to each wife once. <laughs> so <laughs> this, that would have been, <laughs> then he would have just listened to one wife one evening. So it would have been quite a. So I don't know how he was wise, but, but all kings of Israel made their own mistakes. But why did God find such a liking in David? Because he said, David, my throne will be from your family. I think it was because David was, in the end, very honest. David was honest. David was, was, was seeking the Lord above all else. He wasn't seeking vengeance. He wasn't seeking those things. When he made the mistake with Bathsheba, yes, he did make the mistake, but he deeply repented. We read in Psalm 50, 52, we read that David deeply repented and said, I made a mistake. After this, David's whole family also falls apart. His family also tries to kill him. But during it all, during every single thing that happens to him, David remained faithful to the Lord. So, what do I do when things are not going the way I planned? Is it me, Jason? Is it? Uh, thanks. What I do when things doesn't work out according to me, or when I think it does, I go read the Bible and I say, is this the way the Lord works or not? Wil jy Heere hee, jy moet mense doodmaak. Wil jy Heere hee, jy moet mense seer maak. Wil jy Heere hee, jy moet uitgaan en verwoes. Wil jy Heere hee, jy moet gaan vernietig. Mm -mm. Nie so maar nie. Nie so maar nie. Hy sê, laat ek het doen. Laat ek het hanteer. I don't know where you are in your life. Maybe you're in the David part. Maybe you're in the Saul part where you're jealous. Or if you're in the Saul part where you're jealous, do you know where jealousy ends up? Jealousy ends up destroying yourself. If you're really jealous and you continue on, continue on a path of jealousy to others, if you keep on that measuring between you and other people, where do you end up? Killing yourself. Comparison is the death of uniqueness. It's always the death of uniqueness. Or maybe you're on the path of, of David where you say that I just came from maybe the best place of my life and now I'm going through the baddest place of my life. But trust in the Lord, because his timing is different than you and I. Amen.